We have billions of reasons to talk about humanity. Eight billion and counting. You and I are among the largest ever number of people on planet Earth as we mark World Population Day. Now get this. Global population was just one billion a couple of centuries ago. It really shot up in recent decades, adding each billion in as short as 12 years. Asia accounts for more than half of the 8 billion population. What's driving the growth, you ask? Simply put, people are living longer and fewer are dying at birth. Average lifespan is now 73 years, jumping two-thirds over seven decades despite some impact from the COVID pandemic. You can thank better health care, nutrition, hygiene and medicine. The United Nations is calling for women to have more control over their reproductive rights. Females make up half of humanity, which is facing major shifts. Globally, population is forecast to grow at a slower rate, hitting a peak of about 10 and a half billion before the end of the century. Expect more people in all regions except for Europe, where the fertility rate is too low to counter an aging population. The world is facing a crucial three decades of major shifts, which will see Asia and Africa dominating the most populous ranks. Here's the UN's view of the billions. One key change has already taken place. In April this year, the UN said India overtook China as the world's most populous country. It follows China's population shrinking for the first time in six decades, largely due to the one-child policy. The policy was abandoned in 2016, but the ramifications remain. It could develop into a population problem of having too few. A shrinking and aging labor force could slow the economy. For India, the problem could be too many. A younger and growing workforce can boost GDP, but a bigger population demands more food, water, power, homes, transport, further straining the already stretched infrastructure in cities. Food exports could be pulled back to feed the domestic population. There's another demographic change looming. Keep your eye on Indonesia, the biggest economy in Southeast Asia. Currently the fourth most populous. It's forecast to drop to number six, overtaken by Nigeria and Pakistan. Population growth is slowing down. The government is anticipating a potential economic impact. It wants a new family planning policy to have balanced population growth and help young couples have so-called quality children. Many other Asian countries are also re-strategizing to confront a common problem. Not enough births to counter aging populations. With fewer workers generating revenue for the economy, the fallout could hit government investment in infrastructure, welfare and pensions. The problem is so bad in Japan that the Prime Minister has warned the country may not be able to function if the falling birth rate is not reversed. And joining us now is someone at the front line of the issues at hand. John Wilmoth is the United Nations Director of the Population Division. And thank you very much for your time this morning, John. Now, let's start with gender equality, which the UN is calling for, uh, for women to have more control over if and when they want to have children. It cites the positive sign in global fertility rate dropping by half uh, to 2.3 to births per women. But does that, or does this run counter to what countries facing aging populations are trying to do to boost birth rates? Well, I think in general, the philosophy is that uh, you, we should enable people to do what they what they want to do and uh, that they would make good choices for themselves. And ultimately, those will be good choices for the for the country as a whole. Uh, in, in countries where fertility has been rather high, we've seen that when we provide access to modern methods of family planning, people tend to use them and that lowers the birth rate. Uh, in many countries today, the birth rate is very low and there's concern about it being too low and governments have been trying to raise the birth rate. And they've tried many measures to do that. But one thing we know for sure from surveys is that people would like to have more children in those countries. Uh, they're not having as many children as they would like to have. So if they could somehow be supported in uh, the, the challenges of having children and raising a family, then it's possible that the birth rate would come back up. But in any case, uh, the, the general approach is to work to enable people to have the number of children that they would like and when they want them. 
Mm. John, now many Asian countries have struggled for years and even decades to you know, find a sustained success with policies to boost birth rates. Could you pinpoint why the policies are not working in many places? And does the UN see a viable alternative or solution here? I think anybody has the complete answer on this topic. Many countries have tried uh, various measures to raise their birth rates with very measures of success as well. Uh, sometimes we've observed that these measures are effective in the short run. They may encourage people to have a child sooner than they would have had it, but does it really change the number of children that they're having? That's less clear. Um, I think one element that is missing, though, is gender equality uh, across the society. Uh, I'm talking about not only in the workplace and in the, in the public sphere, but also in the home. And I think this is one difference that exists in, in many countries of Northern Europe is a different outlook on these matters and a different approach to gender relations within the household. Uh, so women don't want to have to do a full-time job at work and then go home and do a full-time job at home as well. And I think that's quite understandable. And uh, I think in many, in many parts of the world, it's really necessary to pay attention to this issue, to work toward gender equality, not only in the public sphere, but also in the private sphere, to make uh, life with children manageable for both men and women who are both probably actively employed. Now, among the most populous countries, major structural shifts are underway. India and China will continue to lead Asia's dominance, but more African countries are forecast to rise in the ranks. So what global implications will there be from such significant changes in demographics? Well, it's true that we anticipate that most of the growth of the world's population that will occur over the next few decades will, will occur. It will be due to growth in countries of Africa, and especially sub-Saharan Africa. And so increasingly, the global labor force is going to be uh, African. And I think this definitely has implications for business when we think about where the future markets will be and where the future workforce will be uh, of the world. Um, it's, it's important to keep that in mind. Um, but we've seen these kinds of shifts before. Certainly, uh, there was a shift toward Asia at some point when it was growing very rapidly. And, and gradually, we will see a shift uh, towards Africa in the coming decades, I believe. Speaking of Asia, I mean, economically speaking, the Asia-Pacific region is forecast to become an even bigger engine of growth globally. John, do you see greater wealth bringing greater population to this region? And if so, what kind of potential issues uh, will there be? Well, wealth can attract population uh, in, in the sense if, if people feel that, you know, their lives are prosperous and, and they can afford to have more children, um, if they can afford not only in terms of money, but also in terms of time. And that's where I think it's very important for governments to pay attention to the, the time challenges in people's lives when they're trying to work and have children. Uh, so I think child care, uh, you know, public support of child care uh, is very important. Um, there are other approaches that governments have taken, like paying people, you know, a big bonus, a thousand dollars or something at the birth of a child. And that may encourage them to have a child soon at first when these policies are first implemented. But what really matters is do they have the support day to day, month to month, year to year uh, as they're raising children? And child care, therefore, is very important. Uh, so I think, you know, a prosperous country, as Asia becomes more prosperous, it should think about where it invests its money and investing in the next generation and investing in families who will raise the next generation is very important. And how far do you see or do you foresee migration becoming a vital policy tool for governments to manage their population numbers? Will there be a difference between richer and poorer countries? Well, this is another aspect uh, for countries that are doing well economically. There is the potential to increase population through uh, immigration. And of course, some countries have a tradition of being very open and welcoming to immigrants and others do not. And so I think it's really an open question about whether some countries of East Asia that have traditionally been more closed to migration, uh, whether they will become more accepting of immigration in the future as a means of uh, kind of reinforcing their working age population by importing workers. Uh, there certainly is the potential for this. Uh, but whether countries will accept it and whether, whether the societies in those countries will accept it is still in question.
And it'd be remiss not to talk about climate. Uh, John, there is a new NGO report uh, out that says the population growth is surging ahead of the rest of the world in countries highly vulnerable to climate change. And also combine that with the El Nino and increasing extreme weather. What's the impact on population patterns and how can this be mitigated? It's a very interesting question. And uh, to be honest, I'm not sure that anyone knows the answer about what will happen to population trends as a result of climate change. There are several possibilities that we've talked about. I mean, there's there is a risk in some parts of the world that the extreme weather conditions that climate change is bringing, that, the, that those extreme conditions will bring higher mortality, at least in, in episodes, uh, uh, periods of, of extreme heat that might produce uh, deaths. How significant those will be in the larger scheme of things, we don't really know. But would it really reverse trends in life expectancy at birth, uh, the upward trend in life expectancy at birth? I'm doubtful that it would. Um, I think the, the, the bigger effect that people are concerned about is migration and how much climate change may drive people to leave the places where they've lived. And there are a couple of different situations there. There are low-lying areas where you know, there may be flooding that becomes more common, or certain uh, small islands in the Pacific may become uh, covered in water, and it may be impossible, therefore, to, to live in those locations. Uh, that's one possibility, but I think the larger issue probably is whether climate may in some areas uh, lead to fundamental changes in the economy. It may kind of devastate certain industries, especially agriculture uh, in some areas, and that that would prompt people to want to move. Now, where they're going to move is a question. Will they move within their own countries to the cities, which we've seen many times in the past? You know, this is, is, is this a continuation of past patterns where people uh, face um, various challenges in terms of uh, being agriculturalists and they end up moving to the city? Uh, or will it uh, promote um, or lead to you know, mass movements across international borders? We really don't know. Uh, I would expect that most of the movements related to climate change will be within countries and that countries should be able to accommodate that. Um, but it could also lead to increased uh, demand for uh, international movements. John, thank you for your insight this morning. We'll have to leave it there for now. We've been speaking with John Wilmoth, the United Nations Director of the Population Division.